I'm going to go ahead and get started. The bell's about to ring. Stu led very quickly. I said he gave me too much time to talk tonight. Um, but we're going to go ahead and use the time and go ahead and get started. As we do, we're going to start with the memory verse of the month. So this is Matthew 5, 5. So let's go ahead and recite, recite this together. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So as we are discussing, and we have been discussing worldliness and how as Christians we're going to be confronted with a number of scenarios and decisions we're going to have to make about whether we're going to follow the ways of God or follow the ways of man and the world. Tonight we're going to talk about profanity. As Christians, we're told in Colossians 3 that we need to be thinking or, and being set upon those things that are above. And a lot of times when we think about sin and especially profanity, we think about really debasing ourselves and, and lowering ourselves to a certain standard. And really that's what sin is as a whole. It's about bringing ourselves down to the ways of the devil, the ways of the world, rather than setting our mind on the things above and the things of God. Profanity is a sin that we see frequently around us. Um, the world doesn't seem to have any problem with profanity at all. And we're going to discuss a, a number of ways in which we see that around us. Let's go ahead and start our lesson, though, by just talking about what this word means. So, profane. How do we define that? How does the Bible define that? Tim? Showing this great disrespect. Okay, so irreverent or showing disrespect. Anybody have something else? Contaminated. Oh, okay. Contaminated. Polluted is a word that I had. Yeah. Anybody else? So Webster defines it as showing contempt for sacred things or irreverent. The Hebrew word that's rendered in the Old Testament is this word here, which is to profane or defile, pollute, to desecrate, or to make common. And we see that illustrated in a number of ways in the Old Testament. And we're not going to look at all these passages here. But there's, there's several ways in which the people of Israel were described as being profane. One way would be in, when they profaned the name of God. That's in Leviticus 18.21. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. It said that they profane the Sabbath. And you look at Ezekiel 20, verse 15 and 16. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profane the Sabbaths for uh, for they went after idols. So this is where the they were supposed to keep the Sabbath holy, right? And they didn't do that. They profaned it. They polluted it. They made it less than holy. And then, of course, in the, uh, Ezekiel twenty-two twenty-six, it talks about how they profaned the things within the temple. Her priests have violated my laws and profaned my holy things. They did not distinguish between the holy and the unholy, nor have they made any made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths, so that I am profaned among them. So the Israelites were guilty of ma not making a distinction between the holy things of God and the worldly things of man. To them, they were seeing all things equal. That's not what God instructed them to do. They were supposed to keep certain things holy keep themselves undefiled and clean from the pollutants of the people around them and to which the land that they had settled. They failed to do that, and so they were called profane. In the New Testament, this is the Greek word that's rendered here and is permitted to be downtrodden or permitted to be trodden and accessible, and that's rendered profane in our New Testament five times. We're not going to look at all these either. We're going to look at a few of them. So 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers. And it continues on, and we're going to read the rest of this passage later on in our study tonight. But it decides those as being profane it, within a category here of people who are 
generally lawless without understanding of what God's ways are. First Timothy 4, 7, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourselves towards godliness. So profanity is something that Christians should avoid. We should reject following after that. Second Timothy 2, 16, but shun profane and idle babblings for they will increase in moral ungodliness. So profanity, if we're not careful of rejecting profane things in our life, it's going to lead towards additional ungodliness, things that we don't want to have anything to do with. And so profanity or pro being profane is one of those things that's listed as long that pathway towards sin as being sin, right? And then we come to Hebrews twelve six, which is a reference to Esau. And before we get into what that actually says, I want to go back to Genesis 25 and read the account of Esau and Jacob and what Esau did in regards to his blessing, and then we'll get to Hebrews 12, 16. So let's go ahead and turn back to Genesis 25. And we're going to pick it up in verse 29. Genesis 25, 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with uh, that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am going to I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. But Jacob and Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The Hebrew Hebrew writer talks about this in Hebrews twelve six. Twelve sixteen. I think I made that same mistake in y'all's book, right? Yeah. Sorry about that. Hebrews twelve sixteen. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligent with, w diligently with tears. So Esau here is described as being a profane person. Why? What did he do that was described as profane? He made a common birthright. Right. He took his birthright, which was something special, and made it common. He exchanged it for just something that he could have gotten anywhere. Right. Anybody else have, was going to say something different? He devalued it. Yeah, that's an excellent little way, way of putting that. He didn't esteem it as something special or, or revere it in the way that he should have. He exchanged it for something that was common. He was living for the moment instead of looking towards the future. Um, and even though later he wanted that birthright, later he realized that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. It was too late. There were consequences associated with his choice. What's the lesson of Esau for us? Don't pre be preoccupied with things that are personal here and now, right? And, and devalue you know, things eternal. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, if we're not careful, we can take the things of God, those eternal things, and take them for granted and, and focus instead on the here and now, the physical things. Anybody else? Yeah, so within the context of Christ, even if you back up further to chapter 10, right? And it talks about, uh, in verse 29, trampling the Son of God underfoot. Those people who have seen Christ in the lives of Christians, who have accepted the gift of God through salvation and the forgiveness of our sins, and ultimately reject it as something common. That blood of Christ isn't special. It's like everybody else's, even though, it clearly is. It's the power to take away sins. 
and, and looking towards something else as special. Anybody else? So we see that if we're not careful, we can prioritize other things over the things of God. What are those, some of those things? Work or hobbies or sports, seeking pleasure instead of seeking those things of God, seeking to serve ourselves rather than serve God or serve others or teach our children to serve God. A lot of times we can be distracted by those things. Esau was distracted by what he perceived as a more pressing need. Was he truly about to die? Probably not, right? But he had the perception that what he wanted in that moment was more important than this special sacred birthright that was, by extension, only his. We have the gift of God, the gift of Christ in eternal life and salvation. Are we willing to cast it aside for something else and make it profane? And so in putting this together and looking at this topic of profanity, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word profanity? It's, it's language, right? It's language, but it's much deeper than that. We can be profane people and never say a bad word. And so looking at that topic, I hope that wasn't me. Looking at that topic, I want to talk about some of those things. Certainly, we're going to talk about language at the end of this class, but we need to really have a bigger context of other ways in which we can profane ourselves and profane God if we're not careful. So let's start with looking at, we've already talked about profanity of character. That's what Esau illustrated. And if we're not careful, we can reject the things of God for things below. We can also profane the church. What are some ways we can do that? Exchanging the design of worship that God gave us for what we find pleasing. Yeah, so rejecting the, the pattern that God has given us for sure. That includes secularizing the church, right? We are told um, that the church's purpose in 1 Timothy 3.15 is uh, to be... It is the pillar and ground of truth. That's something that is the sole focus of the church is presenting this truth to people, right? But a lot of times people add in other things. They want something that pleases them. They want to add in a, a different purpose, okay? Acts 2.42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. That was what the church was focused upon in those early days. The Apostles' Doctrine, the truth of Christ, worshiping, observing the Lord's Supper, praying to God. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 talks about a number of things in which God gave the church, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. For what purpose? For the work of the ministry, for edifying the body of Christ, to bring everyone into unity together. And so the purpose of the church is to seek and save the lost. There is a secondary cause of, of serving uh, those saints, and we see that uh, in Philippians and in Romans and in 1 Corinthians and other, other passages where we can serve some of those physical needs of Christians. But a lot of times, if we're not careful, we will bring in other things to supplant that purpose that God has given the church for something else like entertainment or um, going out and serving some physical needs of some community. Those things are good, but they're not the purpose of the church. There needs to be a distinction between those things. So yes, we can profane the church by setting aside God's purpose and putting our own desires in front of that. What, Ryan? Make it, uh, make it where the, the, you basically take the church out of Jesus and our faith and how it's, it's all encompassing that a lot of people I know are you know, they're spiritual, but they, I don't go to church. I'm a believer, but I don't go to church. And I mean, I, I think it's, it's obviously, you know, there's a misunderstanding there. You're trying to set, like, there's a lot of uh, fear of organized religion or however you want to say it, but, but Christ died for the church. Like, it, it's an important establishment in the Bible. And it, it's clear as day if you read it, and it's important, the functions of it are important. And, you know, 
can't right. So, so perhaps putting our own desires in front of the desires of God. Um, I know someone who, as a uh, a chaplain of of a hospital, right, um, doesn't attend services and sees the ministry that's com- done within that hospital, going and praying with people that are sick and those sorts of things, as that's his worship, and then doesn't do anything on Sunday. We can't supplant and change God's design for us as individual Christians either. Just like we can't change out God's design for the church, God has a role and purpose for every single one of us. And we need to fulfill that role, and that includes worshiping on the first day of the week and ministering one to another and a number of other things. Yeah, we can reject those things too. What else? Right, so hypocrisy, yeah, that can split both ways. So we know we're not supposed to tolerate sin within the church, right? Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, the church is the holy temple of God. And so we need to keep that pure and holy. And then you skip a few ver- few chapters to chapter 5, um, and it talks about um, that in five eleven through 13, it talks about how we need to uh, not keep company with anyone named a brother, but living in sin. Right. And so we need to be careful to cut out that sin. But at the same time, when there's repentance and when there is a desire to make things right, we need to be loving and accepting on the other side, too. We can't hold grudges. We can't be hypocritical and say this person is doing something wrong. I'm pure and not look within ourselves, too. Yeah. So there's a lot of things um, within not only tolerating sin, but also being hypercritical of of sin and and people as well within the church, yeah. What else? So I listed some of these that y'all have brought up today. So tolerating sin amongst Christians, and then I appreciate the point of uh, forgiveness and avoiding hypocrisy as well. Secularizing the church, so rejecting God's plan for the church as a whole, or certainly us as individuals. And then also just ignoring God's instruction at all. And I think that was partly what Ryan was talking about too. Um, And so as Christians, we need to be super careful. Profaning the church is something that can't be tolerated, just like profaning our character can't be tolerated and profaning our speech can't be tolerated. And so we need to be cautious to avoid these things. Any, Joanna. Yeah, a lot of times um, we try to make jokes of things because we're afraid of being serious or afraid of, of those emotions that come along with serious topics. Christianity isn't one of those things we can do that. When we lighten things up, what are we doing? We're devaluing the importance of what they are. That's really, it's, it's profaning the subject for sure. Yeah. Anybody else have anything else on this topic? Okay, let's talk about speech. So this is normally what we talk about and think about when we're talking about profanity. Um, And we have to be on guard against that. I looked into some uh, ways in which profanity has become more acceptable within our language. And we talked, I think, about this in the first lesson where we talked about compromising um, our morals. In 1939, Gone with the Wind came out. One word. Right, and there was this public outcry over the one word that was in there. Shouldn't have been in there, okay, but it was, and people were angry about it. It still became the most popular, most uh, profitable movie.
for a number of years. Today, and I looked up the ratings board today, um, profanity is allowed in a PG rated movie, not PG-13, PG, okay? As long as that is not a sexually derived word. So you can take the Lord's name in vain. You can do a number of other things within a PG movie, but you can't say this set of words. You can in a PG-13 movie where we're sending our teenagers to go see these things. So our society has fled from this thought that, oh, this is wrong. We need to protect our children from this. We need to reject this towards this other, th this other end of the spectrum where, sure, we'll allow you to have this amount at this age and this amount at this age and this amount at this age. But God, when he tells us to be pure, which is really the opposite of what profane is, when he tells us to be pure, there's no age descriptor on that. We always need to be pure. We need to be pure as children. We need to be pure as, as Christians, young Christians. We need to be pure as older Christians too. And so we need to be really careful not to deviate with the world as it deviates. Um, in my job, I work with a number of children um, who are in really terrible, terrible situations, right? Um, what's interesting though is that what those kids say when they're away from their parents or what they're repeating what they've heard at home and some of the really horrific things that come out of those kids' mouths when they're upset or they're in distress or they're in pain or when they're angry because what ha is happening to them is not within their amount of control. It's really reflective of what's in our home. When we think about our kids leaving uh, our home and going to schools or going to camps or going to a friend's house, what are they saying that they've heard in our own house? Are they hearing, are they repeating things that we don't, we tell them not to say, but then we hypocritically say on our own? Or are they reflecting the things of God? And we need to be really careful when we're talking about our speech um, that we are reflecting what the Bible says. First Timothy 1, 18, and we've read some of this already, but let's go ahead and back up and read the entire section. First Timothy 1 in verse 8. But we know that law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is anything that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. So here, profanity is really um, contrary, and it describes this perfectly, profanity is contrary to sound doctrine, to true doctrine, to doctrine that is in alignment with God's will. You cannot do these things as listed amongst these sins and be found within the right path to God, that straight and narrow path that leads to the gates of heaven. That includes murdering, that includes uh, fornication, and liars, and kidnappers, and being profane people. And that includes our language as well. Um, Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world, like we said, tolerates profanity amongst pretty much anybody, right? Right? Within our profession, some professions have standards of language in which they don't want you to say certain things. You need to be professional in your speech. But mostly, we'll still tolerate some level of profanity. And some professions don't have such standards. And I've heard people in professions, Christians, who get wrapped up within that and say things because that's what they're hearing all the time in their 40-hour-a-week work life. Um, and if we're not careful, we will likewise be conformed to this world instead of transformed. Let's go to Leviticus 19.
Leviticus 19. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your Lord, uh, of your God. I am the Lord. So, what does this mean to profane the name of your God? What is this talking about? Yeah, so treat it as holy, not something common in reverence. Um, going back to the definition we were talking about, right, is to desecrate it or to make it common. God's, God is not common. And so when we talk about him, to reference him, we need to be sure we're doing it in a way that's reverent of who we're talking about. It's the same concept that's talked about in 1 Corinthians 11 when we're talking about partaking of the Lord's Supper. Take it in a way that's worthy don't treat it as something common be reverent when you're engaged in this activity just like when you're worshiping god talking about god discussing god in whatever context we need to do it in a way that's respectable not profane not diluting his holy name um this how, how can this happen in what ways can we do this today Bear God's name as Christians. Uh, Christ is part of who we are, uh, and so by our very actions, we can treat God as common or holy. This is something that uh, Paul criticizes the Jews for in Romans chapter two. Talks about because of their hypocrisy, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Yes, we bear the name of God, of Christ with us wherever we go. People who know that we're Christians, if they see us acting in a way unbecoming of Christian, we blaspheme his name. We make his name irreverent to them. It's meaningless. When people swear on the Bible and tell a lie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, anytime we swear on anything, right? Um People use that phrase all the time. It doesn't mean anything to them if they're having to say those sorts of things. It, it demeans God's name, his holy name. Yeah, good. Anybody else? But when we fail to, to uh, recognize and appreciate the blessings that we have, and that's so easy to do in this world we live in, we don't uh, regard um, all the advantages we have as yeah we we take our blessings for granted sometimes we take credit for those blessings too um, not recognizing that they came from God and so demeaning his contribution and the, his gifts that he's given us not giving him the proper credit yeah anybody have something else Right, so taking his name in vain, yes. Um, it, it's vanity is emptiness, right? And so you're you're emptying his name of the power that it should have, and making it just this colloquial phrase or acronym that you're using when you shorten it even more. So, yeah, that's a problem that a lot of people have, and a lot of kids, um, little kids, don't have any idea what they're saying, even when they shorten it right to just an acronym they don't have any idea what that means behind it um, and we have to teach our kids God's proper place and value yeah anybody else have something else Joanna Yeah, words have value. They have meaning. And so when we speak, like everything we do, we need to have thought behind what we're doing. We need to have thought behind our words too. Um, speak with purpose. Act with purpose, right? 
making things flippant, especially things that are should be holy, is is not okay according to God's standards. Yeah. Okay. So, what about euphemisms? This is something we see a lot, right? Oh, that wasn't something bad I said. I just said this other word. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? Okay, so corrupt communications. Yes. Why is that word corrupt? What makes that word corrupt? Like if you're implying the meaning of something that's evil, right? Yeah. So changing the name of it or putting lipstick on a pig, right, doesn't change the fact that it's a pig, right? So right. That, that's, what's, that's what euphemism is, right? right? You will know what you mean. Right, and when you say that word in that context, they don't always hear that word. Where does their mind go? Their mind goes to what the word, what word you are substituting out for, right? So you're changing the word, but you're not changing the intention of what you're saying behind it. Yes, um, Matthew 12, 34 and 35. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of good treasure, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Words, when we substitute out other words that are more acceptable, right, but still with the same meaning, is still the same thing. It's evilness. It's, it's still a cursing, right? Ephesians 5, 3 through 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as, it, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give of thanks, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers in them. By using euphemisms, we're, using the, we're giving the perception that we're saying something that's profane. Okay, That is our intention, is to communicate something that's profane by using this word that's more acceptable. How are our coworkers, our neighbors, our friends that are in the world going to view our language if we're still saying and communicating the same things that they are, maybe just with a different word substituted out, right? Are we going to be giving, uh, are we going to be sinning in every way? Is it still going to have the, the form of using profanity? Or are we able to communicate our intentions in a way that doesn't use those types of languages? That those types of words. Does that make sense? So really profanity is just empty speech. Does it accomplish anything about revealing the truth of the gospel? Does it lead people to God? Or do they see our example and our hypocrisy and follow after the other way? What does our speech communicate about us as a people? Does your lack of profanity say something about you? This week I had uh, my desk mate was talk. We were talking about a patient and she was really upset about uh, something that happened, some issue we had with the doctors. Um, and she said a word she didn't, wouldn't normally say in front of me. And she took it back. She apologized. She felt bad yesterday. She felt bad again today about it. Like she knows, I've never had this conversation with her, but she knows that I don't use that type of language. What does our lack of profanity say about our values? If we're using euphemisms, does that dull our, our the outreach or our example? Yes, it does. And so we need to be careful in what words we're choosing but also what we're communicating by those words. Does anybody have anything else on this topic? On this, Stu. Uh, right. 
we, we try to convince ourselves that what we're saying is not really bad, right? But like you said, nobody's confused by that except ourselves. I think you mentioned that to me one point after one of the classes, I don't remember which one. It's really not about how close can we get to that line, right? Euphemisms are an excuse to get as close to that line as we possibly can, rather than shunning profane language. That with the, is the context of getting as far away from it as we possibly can. Euphemisms carry us right up to and over that line. Yeah. Wait. Uh, I was just thinking, like for me, perfect, like the curse words, all that kind of stuff. For me, that's not something I, I deal with or struggle with at my own struggle with other areas. But I was just thinking about euphemisms and the idea of evaluating and making things common. So like, how am I in front of my kids? When somebody pulls over in front of me and drive driving some way that's not good or whatever, so say like they're a jerk or they're an idiot or they're so stupid or use other descriptive words that in of themselves are bad, you know, or somebody on the other side of the political aisle that I don't agree with, whatever, you know. So even even saying things like that, if you're using them in a negative connotation because you're upset or angry. I mean, again, you're making them common and devaluing them as a person. So, I mean, even things like that, that as a dad, that I have to think about. Because I don't have the issue with that, but just saying things like that, it, you know, from a spur of the moment, I mean, that, to me, that would fall into the same thing. Be I, I agree. So, James 2, James 3, James 3, um, and this goes right into what you were talking about. We're going to read select passages from this. James 3. Uh, verse, we're going to start in verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, but we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little kindle fires. Verse 9. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Profanity doesn't, you're right, profanity does not have to be just that, that list of curse words or cuss words that we're talking about. It's anything in which we are trying to curse or devalue something that God has deemed holy. That includes other people. And so when we are calling people jerks or calling them various names or using hateful language, against another person for whatever reason, political, race, different viewpoints. I think that person, what they said was not an intelligent thing. It doesn't matter what it is that they say. We need to be careful that we're still speaking in a way that's loving. Otherwise, we can't curse men and love God who were made in the likeness of man. James says that's impossible. And so we need to be super careful that when we're speaking, we're speaking as God would have us speak about whatever the topic is. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Does anybody else have something? I think for me, um, I, I have, if there's contention between students or even parents and they're using a lot of profanity, I literally have to sanitize my thoughts for days because I have to recap the stuff, I have to write it down. Sometimes I have to send it to district with the bad language because mm -hmm. they want you to actually put the language that was used in the description. And I, it takes me sometimes days to take it out of my head. And I can picture the person saying it to me and it's like in my head and I'm asking God to forgive me for using such bad language <laughs> that I have to repeat because of what was said to me or what I heard. Yeah, yeah. The things we hear and we hear so much of it, it can get stuck if we're not careful. Um, and it really takes a diligent mind to focus on the things above rather than things below. Jimmy. In, in, in a 
moment of extreme emotion that you slip up because something has come out of your heart. The impression that you make on anybody within earshot is going to be a lasting impression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember somebody, I don't, I don't, at this point, this was several years ago, I don't remember who, but someone's mother who was a Christian for decades had aged to the point to where she was losing her mental faculties and regressed to a younger age to where she had said things like that. And now that language was coming out. And so we've got to be really careful to expunge it at a young age and to not be controlled by our emotions because those things can come out. They will come out if we don't really work diligently to, to put them down. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Kevin. Interesting. In Colossians 4, in, in verse 5, it says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And then in verse 6, it says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer. So we're going to walk in wisdom to those that are without. And we're gonna, our speech is going to be seasoned with grace, whether that's about grace or graceful speech, right? It's flavored with spiritual salt, you know. Um, and so that's certainly applicable to, to anything that we say to anyone, whether it's in teaching them or talking to them, responding to them mm -hmm. in any way. Right? Yeah, it goes back to speaking with purpose, with intent behind what you're saying. Think about your words, yeah. Um, this next question, Joanna's already talked about this, so we're not going to go into too much. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, how are we going to be judged? <clears throat> we're going to be judged according to the things that we say. And our words will either justify us or they will condemn us. Which path are we choosing to follow? When we use a word, make no mistake, even in moments where we're frustrated or we're in pain or whatever it is, we're making a choice about what word is coming out of our mouth, out of our heart. What is our heart going to reveal? How is that heart going to judge us in the end if we're not careful? So we've got just a couple of minutes left. What are some ways that you guard your heart against profanity? And it can be language, but it can also be anything that we've talked about tonight. How are you guarding your home? Things, the things that you allow in it. Yeah. So what, what are you turning on the TV? What are you listening to on the radio or on the music uh, channels, apps that we have, right? Yes. I've used profanity mm -hmm. and I ask for forgiveness. So you're saying that are we saying that God would not forgive us? Because he said once we repent, he forgives us, he forgets it. So I mean if we truly are remorseful and we repent of it, God doesn't remember it. He's the one. Agreed. That's what I'm assuming that's what the verse is saying. Yes, I, I would agree with you. Um that anytime we are forgiven of sins, those sins are forgotten. They're wiped off the ledger, right? Um, those words that we speak, okay, that are idle, okay, if we are not careful, idleness, a lot of times the connotation is it's something that's not thought about. And if we're speaking words and not thinking about what we're saying and they have no meaning, are we repenting of those things if we are continuing to follow in that path. I think that's what we're talking about in this context. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Good. Anybody else have any other questions or comments in the last minute and a half? Kevin? Go back to Matthew 12 and, and uh, agree with what you said. That it's more than just uh, idle words are more than just profane words or, or, mm -hmm. or curse words, right? Uh, idle words are useless and unprofitable words. Uh, some, saying something with the wrong intent, not not even lying, right? But but we just have to be so careful uh, with everything we say, and it, it, I think it points to the to the importance and the criticalness that the Lord is going to judge us by, right? Everything that we do, including including how we handle our speech. Not that we can't be forgiven and of that nature, but we need to be so careful, right, of how we conduct ourselves. Speech reveals character, right? And so when we're speaking. It's not just communication with our words, it's with our actions, it's what's within our heart. Um, and if we're not careful, that heart will 
communicate something that we don't necessarily mean for it to communicate. Um, that's where a lot of danger lies. It's not the verbal always. It's a lot of times the nonverbal too. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all for your comments. Next week we're going to talk about gambling.